Most gracious God, just as we have heard those words so beautifully sung, our prayer, O oh God, is that we might indeed trust in you with all of our heart and lean not on our own understanding, but yours, O oh God. Our prayer is that we acknowledge in all of our ways uh, you, that you direct our path. God, as we gather here this morning, we pray with hearts open to trust in you. We give you thanks for this graduating class. And we give you thanks, God, that they call us to remember that each and every one of us is designed by you with a purpose and a plan. God, this morning, in and of myself, I am unable to do what you call me to do. And that is to share your word with your people. I pray that the words that come forth from my mouth are words that are formed by you, that God, whatever is spoken, that you would anoint it in such a way that it would challenge us where we need to be challenged, convict us where we need to be convicted, encourage us where we need to be encouraged. God, set our hearts aflame with such a passion that we cannot do anything but run the race that you have set out before us. God, speak. For your servants are listening. And all of God's followers said, Amen. Amen. Well, good morning. good morning. Good morning. I have a friend by the name of Jeff that is a pastor in Atlanta, Georgia. And he had been a pastor for several years there. And he had decided that it was about time to participate in an Atlanta tradition, which is known as the Peach Tree Road Race. The Peachtree Road Race is held on July 4th every year, and just a few 60,000 people or more come out to participate, to attend. And so Jeff had decided and told his wife, Wendy, that he was going to train and run. And she said, if you run, I will find a friend to walk the race with me. And so they agreed. They both registered online. Jeff began to get really serious, and he started training and running each and every day. The race finally uh, arrived, and he felt great. He felt like he was in the best shape of his life. And so the morning of the race, he walked his wife, Wendy, to where all the walkers were gathered, and he kissed her goodbye, said good luck. Then he went and he found his place amid the pack of where he would run. Sure enough, the gun went off, and he started the 10K race. He finished, and he felt terrific. He thought he had had the race of his life. He hangs around, and he waits until Wendy finishes and crosses the finish line. And then if you've ever run in a race, you know that the next morning, what you want to do is to find out where you placed. So they wake up early, and Jeff goes and starts making coffee, and Wendy is sitting at the table, and she begins scanning the paper for the results. When all of a sudden, she says to Jeff, uh-oh, 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 Jeff, Jeff, they have down here that you ran the 10K race in an hour and 58 minutes. And with that, Jeff almost dropped his coffee. And then as he goes to look at the paper, all of a sudden she starts cackling. And she says, oh, and they said that I walked the race in 51 minutes. <laughs> you see, what had happened is that the day before the race, Jeff was being a good husband. He went to downtown Atlanta. He picked up their race packets. And then he went back home and he took their race numbers out. And he fastened them to Wendy's race shirt. And he took out his number and he fastened it to what he thought was his race shirt. But inadvertently, what had happened is he had put his number on Wendy's clothes and had put Wendy's race number on his shirt. Today we gather and we celebrate the tremendous accomplishment of our seniors. And the reason I tell you the story about Jeff and Wendy it's because what ultimately happened is that Jeff ended up running Wendy's race and Wendy ended up walking Jeff ra Jeff's race. And by so doing, they ran a race that was never theirs to run to begin with. As graduating seniors, you will be tempted to run a race that is not yours to begin with. 
as you begin to discern God's purpose and plan for your life, if you are not careful, you will fall prey to running a race that we were never intended to run in the first place. You see, sometimes people run their parents' race, whatever their mother or father tells them that they need to do. Sometimes they run a friend's race or a brother's race. Sometimes they run a race just because somebody says, this is what you need to do with your life, and they feel that they need to be running somewhere, so they just start running. And what happens is that when you begin running a race that was never yours to run in the first place, there is always something within your spirit that feels a little off kilter. There is this nagging feeling within that there is this potential that is lying dormant that is simply waiting to be shared with the world. You've been a part of the past 18 years of a congregation that lives with the purpose and the mission and the vision to make and grow and send disciples for Jesus Christ. Over these past 18 years, our prayer is that you realize that you have been made claimed and designed by God's hand alone. That you are fearfully and wonderfully made. And that the creator of the universe has designed you in such a way that God longs to be in relationship with you. God pursues you and wants you to know how much you are loved by our Heavenly Father. Today, we gather around you as Christ's body, the church, not only affirming that God has made you, and designed you, and that God loves you, but God now sends you forth into the world. God desires to empower you to be a force to be reckoned with to a world in need. Now, as many of you uh, entered worship this morning, you were asked to make a fingerprint, either a thumbprint or a fingerprint as you entered. If you did so, I want to invite you to take that out now. And as you look at that, I want you to compare it to your neighbor's fingerprint or a thumbprint. And uh, does it look like it is exactly the same? Does it look like it's the same in any way? What we know is that the answer is no. We know that God designed us in such a way that there are no two fingerprints alike. Even identical twins have different fingerprints. We know this. We know the scientific evidence behind it. We could lay all of these fingerprints out side by side and know that none of them will be exactly the same. But for some reason, we fail to remember this truth when it comes to God's claim upon our life. You see, God has placed God's divine, unique fingerprints upon each and every one of your lives. And when I talk about God's fingerprints, I'm referring to the way that God has wired you, the passions that God has put inside you, your strengths, your weaknesses, your interests, your desires. Those are markings of God's thumbprints and fingerprints upon your life. And the reason that they are so important is that as we discover God's thumbprints upon each one of our lives, then they become clues about God's purpose in God's plan for our life. Scripture reminds us that we are to run a race with perseverance that is set out for each and every one of us. I believe that there will be a day where we will stand before God and God will say, what did you do with the thumbprints that I gave you? What did you do with the way I gifted you and the way I wired you and the way I designed you? Tell me how you ran the race. And you see, God's not going to ask me, Reagan, why didn't you run Trey's race? Why didn't you run Mary Margaret's race? Why didn't you run Elizabeth's race? God is going to say, Reagan, how did you run your race? God's not going to compare me with anybody else. And so why do we feel compelled to compare ourselves with others? You see, when it comes to figuring out our unique design, the truth of the matter is is that a lot of people don't do this. If we're honest, many people will spend more time considering the makeup of their fantasy football league than they will considering their own unique 
makeup and design by God. There are others that will look and check in on Facebook to the status that other people's post rather than considering their own unique status that God has created and designed them with. You are headed off to college and the questions have already begun to be asked. The questions of where are you going to school? What are you going to major in? What are you going to do with your life? The questions that are being asked are, what does the race of your life look like? What are you going to do with the fingerprints and the design that God has impressed upon your very life and upon your very heart? And how are you going to run? You see, when you get to college, you're going to have an opportunity to figure all of this out. You'll have an opportunity to remind yourself not only of who you are, of whose you are, but that God has uniquely wired you with a purpose and with a plan to intersect with the world's needs. And you can take this time that is before you to lean into God, to look and discover what it is that God desires to do in and through the one incredible gift of life that you have been given. When I grew up, I wanted to be a jockey. I did. I loved horses. I loved horse racing. Uh, My parents lived near the racetrack, and so there are mornings where we get up and we'll go watch the horses and the jockeys work out. There'll be a time where we can also go and eat with the jockeys, and I thought, it would be great to be a jockey. Now, I had no idea that I was going to be 5'9 and weigh 102 pounds. I didn't know that. I had no idea. After wanting to be a jockey, I wanted to be a doctor. I wanted to be the kind of doctor that brought babies into this world. I thought it'd be amazing to be a part of that moment where a child takes his or her first breath. That's what I wanted to be. And then I shared the story with you before about in the fourth grade, somebody asked me what I wanted to do, and I said, I want to be a youth minister because I want to get paid to go on ski trips and go to the beach. (laughs) Now, just so you know, Trey does way more than this, way more than this. And um, so I began trying to pursue God's calling upon my life. I was a part of a faith tradition that did not allow women to preach. And so I loved my faith tradition. They had formed me and shaped me. And so I began to say, well, what can I do as a female? I looked around and I saw that women were allowed to teach. And so I signed up to teach a group of second grade girls. Let me tell you, I was awful, (laughs) awful. I mean, the kids were miserable. I was miserable. There may be a group of girls now that are adults that are still warped by my teaching way back then. I was trying to run a race that became very clear that I was not intended to run. Then I noticed that... uh, in this faith tradition that the wives of these pastors got to stand behind the pulpit and talk and sometimes even preach a little bit. And I thought, that's my ticket. I'm going to marry a pastor. And then I'll just kind of sneak my way in and that'll be my way to preach. And the humor of it all is that I actually really did marry a pastor. I mean, that's the funny component of it, aspect of it. Um, And what happened is that I went to college. And I dated a young man who is now actually an ordained pastor in Arkansas. And he said, uh, you know, in this United Methodist Church, women can preach. And they can teach. And he even had a sister that was in the Alabama conference that was a pastor. And so I was in a sorority, and I was looking for a home church in uh, the town in which I was attending college. And one of my sorority sisters said, hey, my parents are worshiping in this new church that's meeting in this gymnasium. Why don't you go check them out? And so the Sunday came, and I got dressed, and I went, and I saw this guy who was wearing blue jeans and Birkenstocks. And he would run, and he would play the drums, and then he'd jump up and he'd preach. And I thought, if this is church, I am digging it. I am. I can do this. I can relate to this. And so when I walked out that day... I shook his hand and said, I would love to work with you someday. That's all I said. Went back to my dorm room. 
And so the next morning, I got a phone call where he had got the registration attendants, had found my name, and said, can I take you to lunch? And so it was that lunch that began a wonderful friendship and relationship with a man that would become my mentor even today. That summer, I went to Japan to play tennis with Athletes in Action. And when I returned, he said, I want you to apply to be what? A youth minister in the church. And you know what happened? I got paid to go to the beach, and I got paid to go on ski trips. And what happened also at that moment is that throughout my time in the church, I had opportunities to preach. I remember the first time I was asked to preach, I felt so sick. I felt so sick. And the pastor came up and said, how are you doing, Reagan? And I said, I feel like I'm going to throw up. And so instead of just quietly praying over me about how anxious I was, he just announced it to the whole church. Reagan thinks she's going to throw up, so let's just pray for her. <laughs> My first time in preaching. Um, and something incredible happened at that moment. Because as I stood there and I opened myself praying that God would use a very flawed vessel to be God's mouthpiece for that moment in time, my heart got set on fire. I knew without a shadow of a doubt that I was exactly where I was called to be, using the gifts that God had equipped me to use for such a moment and in such a time as this. And I knew at that moment as I was alive in a way that I had never been alive before that I wanted to do this for the rest of my entire life. And the interesting thing is, is that all of those desires that I had as a kid to be a jockey, to give and be a part of new life that is brought into the world, believe it or not, in the role that I have here as your lead pastor, I'm living into that. Because whether you know it or not, sometimes the church is like a wild Mustang. <laughs> and there are days where you are just hanging on for dear life. There are days when that Mustang begins to buck and when you get thrown off, and if you're a horse rider, you know that any time you get thrown off, how do you respond? You get right back on. And then there are moments where we gather together as Christ's body of the church, where we have a common vision, where we have a common purpose, where our heart is humble and is before the Lord, surrendered before Christ, where we begin to run in like accord in such a direction towards God where we are one in nature, where we hold on for the ride of our life. And you see, when it comes to bringing new life into this world, last week we confirmed 14 sixth graders. And what many of you were not a part of in the 11 o'clock service is that at the 845 service, we baptized four of them. We were about the celebration of new life of what it means to be born again in this world in such a way that it makes an eternal difference. You see, those were early markings. Those were early indications of God's thumbprints and passions and desire and design upon my life that would ultimately serve as clues for the race that I was called to run, and it's no different for your life. What we know is that when it comes to running a successful race, you need several things in place. And the first is that you need good support. You ask any runner, and their shoes are really important. That which is going to sustain you through the duration of your race is essential. But even beyond shoes are the individuals that you choose to support yourself and that choose to surround you to offer and to speak words of encouragement upon your life. You have been blessed to be part of an incredible congregation. And we want you to know that we support you that we surround you, that we encourage you, that we believe that God has incredible things in store for each and every one of you, and that as you go forth to run your race, you do not run alone. We also want you to know that the people that you choose to surround yourself will ultimately influence the person that you become. Have you ever had a parent freak out at your choice of friends? Yeah, parents, have you ever freaked out at your child's choice of friends? The reason that they do this is because they know this truth. That the people that you choose to surround yourself 
will ultimately influence the person that you become. And so as you go forth into this world, be intentional about those individuals that are going to surround you, that are going to support you, that are going to encourage you, that are going to build up your faith, helping you discover God's unique design for your own life. Not only is support important, but you've got to practice and train. You can't show up on race day having never run a day in your life and think you're going to have a fabulous race. It's going to hurt. It's going to be an awful experience. When it comes to our faith, it is something that we are called to practice day in and day out. You will be tempted when you go to school to set your faith to the side. You will be tempted, as many students are, to say, I'll get to God when it's convenient. Because right now, I want to live the life that I want to live. I'll get to God in four years when I graduate. And then you say, I'll get to God when I get that job that I want. And then I'll get to God when I find that spouse that I want to marry. Or I'll finally go back to church when I have a child. God wants to be a part of every single facet of your life. Every decision that is made beginning now. And so we invite you to abide in Christ, to remain in Christ, and by so doing, to be intentional about studying and encountering God through the gift of His Word, to be in prayer and communion and conversation with God, to be intentional about a community of faith, of those that will support you, and to find ways to be in service to a world that is broken and a world that is in need. You see, we've talked about God's unique design for your life. We've talked about God's fingerprints or thumbprints upon your life. We've even talked about that there is a specific race for you to run. But the truth of the matter is that this is not about you. As Christians, we are called to surrender our lives in such a way that God has gifted you and wired you that when you put your hands and in your, your life in the hands of an almighty God, then God takes those passions and desires and intersects them with the world in need. And before you know it, that your unique design that God has made is not only about what God's doing in your life, but how God's going to use you to touch an entire world. You see, God is grooming men and women to be forces that are to be reckoned with, to be followers of Jesus Christ that not only affect their college or their community, that not only affect this country, but affect the world at large. And God chooses to use you if you will so open your life and have God be a part of the race that you shall run. You see, at the end of every race, there's the finish line. That's the desired goal. And right now, a finish line is graduation from high school. And then we hope and pray four years from now, graduation from college. But there will come a day when you will cross the ultimate finish line in life. And it will be a day in which you enter into life eternal with Christ. And on that day, we hope and pray of the, those that will surround, that will celebrate you coming home, and to hear those words of Jesus himself that says, My good and faithful servant, job well done. You have leveraged my fingerprints upon your life and you have found your race and you have run and you have run well. Seniors, the race is about to begin. On your mark, get set. Are you ready to go? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. I mean, a lot of memories just come to mind when you think of about First United Methodist Church. You got... Sixth grade confirmation retreat, because that's when I first accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior. First year at Breakthrough, when I was in seventh grade. My senior year of Breakthrough with my small group mission trip to Beaufort, South Carolina with the church. Youth trips we went on, the Rapton trip, Breakthrough and all that. Our small group beach trip. It was a lot of fun, and we all kind of got to bond. It, what feels like a couple of months ago, I was a seventh grader or a sixth grader, and I was coming up and seeing all the older people and wondering, like, when will I ever get there? And now that I'm here, I'm just kind of like, well, where did the time go? I don't feel like it's my time to be a senior yet, but 
it's here and it's almost gone. This is just such a family and I've always felt so comfortable and welcomed and just very much like I belong here. So many people here on staff and not on staff that'll help you with your walk through Christ. And I've seen this church welcome me like with all the all the parents that help up here. Um, Miss Celia Ford, Mr. Norman Ford, Andy Tintoni, they've been they've welcomed everybody in this youth group and they've been such a blessing. Baker Swedenberg, he was a uh, he really inspired me. Seeing him, you know, really into it really into the church, uh, you know, just made me want to be a part of the church. My strength has been strengthened mostly by Miss May Margaret Swedenberg. She is our small group leader. She is a wonderful lady. She's always there for me. Whenever we are having trouble meeting with small group times, and she'll always make us food, and she's just the best person. And she's always set a great example in her faith and how strong she is, and she is one of my role models. I really just want to be like her when I get older. FUMC has kind of been a home for a really long time, but I think that in being a home and like in all of our friends and family that are here now, they've really helped prepare all of the seniors to step up and be leaders. When I go to college, I hope to find like a church that I like fit into and like. And then, you know, when I come home, I'll still come back to this church. When I came and uh, moved here, they just really welcomed me in and made me feel like this was my home and like I wasn't new, that I belonged here. Definitely look for like another you know, Methodist church over in, uh, in Storville that, you know, has very similar qualities that this church has. That just Everybody just want to welcome you in. I plan on kind of testing the waters when I get to college and seeing where I feel best and most at home. Um, and hopefully, I'm only going to be 30 minutes away, so hopefully I'm going to be able to come back here as much as possible and still remain in my church and my home. Well, I will be attending the W here in Columbus, so I plan on attending Sunday church here, early service here at FUMC. I think I'm going to remain like in this church and like come back as much as I can like on the weekends or holidays. Just trying to go back to church as much as I can, uh, trying to find a new church and start for next year or even coming back here sometimes. I plan on continuing going to church when I go to Oxford, Mississippi to attend Ole Miss and I'll be trying out different churches, seeing where I fit best. When I was trying to decide where I wanted to go to school, like, I didn't really care, but I always asked God. I just, I just kind of sat down and I was like, God, I want you to send me where you're going to use me. And when I kind of was leaning towards Southern and then the job offer came along, I was like, I kind of knew that that's where he wanted me to go because he was going to use me in Hattiesburg. love to thank the church for everything that they've blessed me with, with all these opportunities to learn and serve and um, accepted me and welcomed me into this community.